Hi everyone, it's Eve Bentley Blowitz from the Spirit Girl Talk Show Podcast. I'm super excited to be here with you today in this online audio space and with our very special guest, Beth Wyatt, who is an insomnia, rest and self-care coach and meditation teacher. She is certified in sleep sciences and life coaching. Her mission is to help women appreciate sleep as the ultimate act of self-care and to achieve a peaceful night's sleep naturally and effortlessly. Welcome, Beth. How are you? Hi, Yvette. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm super, super excited you're here with myself today and the Spirit Girl podcast global audience. Can I say congratulations on becoming a published author and for the launch of your book, which is The Calm and Cozy Book of Sleep. Congratulations. This is such exciting news for yourself, your community and the rest of the world. Ah, thank you. You've been so supportive and I'm so proud of the book. Yeah, this book is available in Australia in Kmart. Um, and I have to say, as soon as I saw the title and the beautiful print, and more importantly, when I read what was in there, when I turned to the back, it says a good night's sleep can change your life. And when you talked about sleep being the ultimate act of self-care, I just thought, wow, I have to share this book. I have to read it and I have to find out more how our audience can feel good from within by the ultimate act of self-care, sleep. So Beth, before we dive into a couple of sections in your book, can I ask you to share a little bit about yourself and your journey of what inspired you to want to become an actual sleep coach and also a published author? <laughs> yeah, I'd love to. I struggled for years uh, with insomnia, which really leads to everything I've done now, but I am a multi-passionate person. I, I'm very creative. I always have 50,000 projects on the go. And that was not working well with my sleep schedule. Uh, so in my 20s and my 30s, I ha always had a lot on the go. I always had my full-time job and all of my projects. And sleep was the last thing on my priority list because I always felt like there wasn't enough time to do the things I wanted to do. My sleep was suffering and I was also finding that I, when I finally was lying down to sleep, my mind would race and I would just spend hours in bed just lying there thinking about my projects I had on the go or what was going on tomorrow or reliving a conversation from my day that didn't go well. Uh, so sleep really wasn't on my radar for a few decades because it was a stressful thing for me and it was also an inconvenient thing for me so that all caught up to me in my I would say my late 30s I was unhealthy um, I didn't feel good I had a lot of hormonal problems a lot of health issues stemming from hormonal issues I was gaining weight and not really understanding why um, I just didn't have the time and the energy to get out of the rut that I was in, the unhealthy rut. Um, I, I always like to, to say I'm a happy person. I choose joy in my life. So I, I was as happy as I could be, that I could choose to be, but I always felt like I was living in a fog. I always felt like I was just kind of walking around like a zombie uh, trying to sleep whenever I had extra time to sleep, which usually, usually ended up oversleeping um, because I was just so exhausted all the time. So that really led to, um, I have always had my own, um, I've always been entrepreneurial. I come from an entrepreneurial family. In the Wyatt family, if, uh, if there's a job that you want and you can't find a job 
opening, you make your own. So you fill your own job description. So that's what I did. I, w I wanted to have my own business and do something that was creative, that was fulfilling for me outside of my full-time work that I was in. So I started looking online for uh, a wellness coach certification. Um, which I know is just kind of a very vague thing. I just wanted to be a wellness coach and I was looking for certifications and found the sleep, a sleep sciences coach course. Um, so to be a certified sleep sciences coach, which at the time I was not interested in doing that, I just saw sleep and thought that would be the perfect thing for me to take because I could certainly use some help with my sleep. So I think I was thinking I thought it would go well with my wellness coaching, but also if I'm going to start my own business, I need to sleep and I need to be well. So it seemed like the perfect opportunity. I took the course. I loved it. I became really passionate about sleep and uh, improving my own sleep. I don't want to say like healing or fixing um, because everything is a journey, right? But um, improving my own sleep, the more I learned about sleep, the more I loved it and the more I was sleeping. So that has really, that's been, that's the journey. I started my business three years ago and I, I was started coaching a little, but I actually found that social media influencing seemed to really be my, my specialty at the time. I was attracting brands. I, um, the sleep industry online is very small which is very unfortunate because everybody on the planet sleeps and more people need to be talking about it. So I did find that I, I just kind of fit in perfectly because I had no competition. I could just kind of make my own rules in that space. And that's what I've done. I think I'm kind of standing out a little because I have a bit of a unique voice. And I was approached on Instagram to write a book on sleep. And I've my father's a published author of 10 books, so writing is also something that I've always enjoyed. So I, I feel like the struggles that I went through, everything was worth it. Like everything was leading up to what I'm doing now, and which just came full circle. Like I'm, I'm in everything that I have done up to this point. Um, I, close the circle for me <laughs> if I can use like a bad metaphor. <laughs> wow, that is such an incredible journey. And I can congratulations on everything you have achieved and all Thank from you. basically being open to learning about sleep. And then it's just incredible. And your dad has published like what, written 10 books. That's phenomenal. <laughs> And I love now how you are, you've are. you learnt all about sleep and then you've had to figure out your own sleep, how to get a good night's sleep. And as a result now, you know, you're able to coach other women and help other people through social media. And I totally agree. We talk a lot about self-care maybe in the form of yoga or popping on a face mask or positive affirmations, mm -hmm. but not so much diving into how important sleep is for our mental health, our physical health, our well-being, our emotional health, and just feeling good. Because I know if I have a shit night's sleep or haven't slept enough, I wake up the next day and you feel so exhausted, so tired, you just don't have the energy and feel good energy to, you know, go and seize the day. Like you might feel so tired that going for that walk can be affected or, you know, you feel tired and grumpy. You just, maybe you don't eat as well because your body's craving like fatty foods. Um, you maybe drink too much coffee because you're trying to sort of, perk yourself up so it really sleep when I saw is the ultimate act of self-care can I ask like obviously sleep is so important for you as a sleep coach and one of your self-care rituals but what are some other self-care rituals you do as well as a sleep coach other than going to bed at the right time <laughs> 
I try, yeah, I try to go to bed at the right time. Um, I love walking as soon as the weather is nice enough to walk. I'm walking every morning. I, I wake up looking forward to my walk and it's also, it's great alone time. And I also love listening to audiobooks and podcasts. That's when I do a lot of my learning for my business is that's the perfect time for me to be listening and learning while I'm walking. So I feel, I feel like I'm getting both those things done at the same time, which is not about being productive with self care. It's just that I, I do feel like because there's only so many hours in the day, it's great that I can do things, two things that I love to do at the same time. Um, and it, and it's good for me. So I love walking. Um, I take frequent breaks. I, I'm an entrepreneur. I also, I also still work a full-time job. I'm, I've always been very open with that because I, I like when women are opening open about um, balance or like the myth of balance. <laughs> so I always like to tell people I work a full-time job and I have my own business. So things get really busy and I could be the first person to say there's, there's not enough time for sleep or there's not enough time for rest. So I feel like I, I'm allowed to preach this because I'm living it. Um, but taking frequent breaks and having hobbies that have nothing to do with my, with my online business are also um, a way that I practice self-care. I crochet. I've been doing it for about 11 years. I love it. Every, as soon as it fall comes, like as soon as it's autumn, I'm making all my Christmas gifts. I start, you know, September, October. Um, everybody in my family gets like hats or slippers or scarves. I just started making myself sweaters last winter. So, um, and these are not like old time, like granny square sweaters from the 60s. These are like they're nice they're nice sweaters <laughs> they're nice hats like people like getting stuff for me um and they wear them which is the best thing for for a creative to see someone making or some someone wearing something that I've made so I do spend a lot of time crocheting I have creative projects that are outside of my business my business is very creative but I like to to do other things as well um and I'm a classic like Netflix binger so I also have to make sure I'm turning off the TV at a good time and practicing um, all the healthy habits that I tell people about. Um, also something that I've had to learn to do that I truly believe is self-care for myself is saying no to things that I don't have time for, things that stress me out. Um, I'm, I'm an introvert. I think I'm good with people. I make friends easily, but I'm painfully introverted. And if I can stay home and do my own thing every night of the week, I will. And it's my favorite way to spend time is just like doing my own thing. <laughs> I love people around me, but I also love my own company. So yeah. uh, saying no to things that are draining for me is a way that I practice self-care because there's, I think there's a fine line between, um, stepping out of your comfort zone and doing things that are that are good for you that stretch you but then also knowing what drains your energy and is just not worth it so i've i've gotten really good especially since i started my business at saying yes to things that i know that maybe i don't really want to do that but it's good for business but then also knowing if i ext like get extreme anxiety as soon as i'm invited to do something I'm going to listen to that and I'm going to go, you know what? It's probably not a good time for me and I don't want to have anxiety for the next week. <laughs> or I don't want to be anxious leading up to this thing and um, have no time or energy to do other things that I need to do because I'm anxious about this thing. So I find saying no for me is, as an introvert is huge for self-care. That I, <laughs> I preach that to everybody. Say no more often and be okay with that. I like come up with a funny way of saying it. I'll say like, oh, thank you so much for the invitation, but that sounds like my worst nightmare right now. So I'm going to say no. <laughs> like, just, I, like, I, I, love I, say, I like to like, I say it makes rejection fun. Put your sense of humor into it. Like I hate saying no to you, but I'm going to say no to you. Like <laughs> this is a hard pass on this one. Like going to a party with a bunch of people I don't know. No, because I have stuff to do tomorrow and I don't want to feel hungover. Like knowing what I you need and, 
and uh, being in touch and in, in tune with what you need. Yeah, I love those um, self care tips. And I can resonate. I found it very difficult to say no. So kind of like over the last couple of years when blogging popped, like at the start of blogging, you know, 10 years ago or, or eight, even eight years ago, it was just a hobby. And so you work full time, you did it in between. And then over the last couple of years, it became an opportunity where it's, developed into more than a hobby like and money came into it and opportunities with brands but then also there were so many social media gurus saying you know hustle hustle um like oh i built my following you know by commenting back to every single person getting back to every dm um and i was up to 1 a.m 2 a.m like trying to keep up with the volume of inboxes and dms and comments mm. and then we were told you know you need to post three instagram posts a day to be uh popular to stand out to build brand so there was so much content going on that it just exploded in the amount of content but i know i got caught up in doing versus sleeping and what i've learned that staying up to 12 o'clock one o'clock 2 a.m trying to keep up with commenting back or dms is not for me sustainable and it really affected my health like my mental health Mm. um, my physical health so i've learned now i've had to set boundaries but for someone who is kind of like working full-time Maybe they've got a blog, maybe they've become an influencer, or maybe now for their day spa, they have to run a social media page, which the requirement is to keep it up to date, to think of creative ideas, to think of content. So perhaps they're doing it after the children go to bed at 8.30. Do you believe that we still need to have a cut off time? Because what I learned was it didn't matter how late I stayed up to, I couldn't still get to the the volume of work or I still couldn't get to what needed to be done. And I found that at night time, I'm probably not my most creative, like I'm way more creative fresh in the morning. So I've learned that sleep's so important for me. I need to get to bed early and then wake up fresh, do my self-care rituals, then do social media or then do um, creativity or I'm even probably better after work but would you agree we have to become self-disciplined to go okay we are going to hustle but at the same time if we want to feel good and have good mental health good physical health let our body and brain and, and organs and everything recover we have to have a cut off time we must sleep. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I agree with everything you just said. <laughs> I'm giving you like an amen sister to, to all of that uh, because I lived through that too. When I started my business, I, I put everything aside. I stopped working out um, because I felt like I don't really have time to go to the gym. I have stuff to do and that's not good for me. Um, I was staying up late um, one of the amazing things that sleep does, um, like it restores everything. It restores every system and function of the body as you sleep. And when we're, we have, you know, 50 things on our to-do list, um, but sleep isn't one of them. We're not giving our body and our brain a chance to recharge overnight and to give us, it's just kind of like, um, like turning off the light switch and turning it back on again. Like, it's morning, it's time to like start afresh with, you know, everything in our brain or everything we have to do. Um, consolidating memories is one of the things that I think is cool that our, that our body does, that our brain does overnight while we're sleeping. And I like to think of it as like all the things that I'm learning today that are, that are going to be beneficial for me in my business or in my life when I'm not going to bed, I'm not giving myself, my brain and my body a chance to consolidate those 
into memory so that tomorrow I'm going to remember them. <laughs> like, if you're constantly learning and applying things that you're learning to your life and your business, cutting sleep short is doing you a disservice. It's sleep is not an inconvenience. It's a necessity. And especially when we're in an industry that's constantly moving and constantly, like you said, telling us you have to be posting three times a day. And how are you going to do that if you're not even remembering the things you're learning or you're exhausted all the time? And I fell into that trap as well. That hustle culture really was something I followed a lot of influencers on Instagram who had that message of like, you should be doing more. This isn't enough. Uh, you should be wanting more. And it really took uh, it really took a tragedy in our family to make me realize that um, most of the things, half the things that were on my to do list, weren't really that important after all. And if I were to put aside a lot of these things that aren't important um, and put myself and my own health and my family first, that I was going to be a lot happier in the long run. And it's been more fulfilling for me to to be in business and to enjoy my business when I can also enjoy the downtime and have time with like doing things I love and time with people that I love. And it's too bad that I do find that a lot of people have to hit a wall or, or go through a tragedy or um, have like go through a health crisis to finally be forced to stop. And it's like something comes and hits you on, over the head and says, okay, you need to stop. Like this is too much. And when I first started podcasting, I, I read an article that said, um, once you get on a regular podcasting schedule, you have to stick to that schedule or you're going to lose listeners. And I kept thinking of that. And, but at the time when I started, I was on a weekly schedule. And one of the things that happened when our family had this tragedy that we lost somebody that we loved and it affected all of us so deeply and differently. One of the things that hit me was I don't, I don't really care if I lose listeners. Like this isn't about an audience. It's about building a business that I love and I'm passionate about. And I can help people by doing a podcast episode every other week. Like I'm not, I'm not hurting anybody, but myself by sticking to a schedule that doesn't work for me and that exhausts me. So I, I, I don't do weekly podcast episodes anymore. It just doesn't work for me. I have too much going on. Um, but I also find I'm enjoying it more because I have more time to choose a topic or to to write an episode or to find the right guest. So this is not to like tell people that they shouldn't do things on a regular basis. It's like when you get hit with the um, realization that you're doing too much and not all of it is important, you look at it and go, okay, there is a time for hustle, but there is a time for rest as well. And you can't have one without the other. You can work hard and play hard. I, I do believe that you can do that and that they, they're they kind of like summer and winter. Like <laughs> I can say that because I'm a Canadian. We have very harsh winters and we have very hot summers, but um, they balance each other out. Like you kind of look forward to the cold winter when you're in the middle of the heat <laughs> and vice versa. And I feel like that with rest and, and work as well. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear about your family tragedy and loss. And I feel that we can all resonate with you for all of our listeners who are tuning in because at the moment, everybody is suffering some loss due to COVID-19, whether that's loss of job, sadly loss of just day-to-day -day routine, loss of even hugging their loved ones just loss of a loved one due to COVID-19 or loss of like in Australia, we are unable to travel internationally. And at the moment we are in lockdown in Melbourne. So people are losing businesses. So there's a lot of loss going on, but I think it has also for me, COVID-19, one of the blessings that have come from it was a realization that I was doing way too much and I was trying to hustle so much and do so much. And I was saying yes to so many people and yes to this and yes and yes. And I was saying yes to everything that it like the most positive thing to come from it is realizing I need to do less is more. So the less I do 
And I too got caught up in the having to do the every Monday podcast show. And then <laughs> we had a family tragedy. Also, my mum got critically ill and sadly was, you know, that day we were told she might not make it because she got pneumonia this year and had a seizure and went into a coma. And I think that's when I realised that it was okay for me to do, to show up and record a podcast show when I really felt compelled or when I felt it came from my own heart and soul and it was okay to be creative when it organically or when it came from within so because the creative process shouldn't be just a time schedule it should arise from within when you feel like mm -hmm. it when um when it arises and I think going back to the basics um that has really helped me now to feel so much better I feel less stressed less overwhelmed in a time where most people feel stressed out and overwhelmed. I've just gone like, okay, I'm just going to do less and accept it, get my sleep, do my self care rituals um, and read books. But Beth, I want to ask you for someone who is perhaps struggling when they go to bed at night it's the one time that they're, all the, the distractions are gone. So they're not looking at their mobile phone, their family are in bed, um, you know, they're not watching TV. So they're unable to escape their thoughts, their feelings, their emotions. For someone who has a lot of thoughts going on in their head, have you got any tips when it comes to being an overthinker when you go to bed? I do, because that was me for a long time. Um, I, yeah, I call, I, I like the term bedtime thinker. Um, I feel like, I, I don't know, maybe someone else coined the phrase first, but I think that um, I was the first one to put it in print, definitely, so it's mine now. Um, but I like bedtime thinker because I, um, I don't think that everybody who struggles with um, racing thoughts is necessarily an insomniac. So I don't like to use that term just for everybody as a blanket statement. So for someone who's a bedtime thinker and gets into bed and can't, um, can't, uh, I would say like calm racing thoughts, um, your head hits the pillow and at the time when you should be resting the most, that's when your brain starts um, my favorite technique and it's so simple but it really does work is to say instead of focusing on falling asleep but just focus on rest picture your your whole body just resting in your bed comfortably in whatever position is most comfortable for you under cozy blankets or in like your coziest clothes and just rest and be okay with with rest being the only goal. If you went to bed every night and the only thing you did was rest, rest is good for you too. And we need sleep, but I think that the problem is we put so much pressure on ourselves to fall asleep that it's the last thing that we're gonna get. Um, we're pushing sleep further away, the more pressure we put on ourselves to fall asleep, especially by a certain time. So I always like to tell people, put your clocks away, don't even, have a clock in your room that faces you that you can see easily um, so that when you're in bed it's not you're sleeping or you're awake it's you're sleeping or you're resting so that you get used to the fact that rest is good for me too what resting isn't is like getting up and pacing or turning your pillow over and hitting it a bunch of times or being frustrated um, be still and rest is like my favorite, <laughs> probably like my favorite thing in the book is just like be still and rest because resting is good for you too. And when you take the focus off of falling asleep and you take the pressure off yourself to fall asleep, that's when sleep happens because our bodies want to sleep. So when, when you're exhausted and you go to bed and you're not falling asleep, there's a disconnect there and it's usually the brain that's stopping the body from falling asleep. Um, I also like to tell people, stop being frustrated by the thoughts that you have at night. 
and accept that you're a bedtime thinker. You're an intelligent person. You have a lot of thoughts in your head. You can't control the thoughts that you're having, but you can control your reaction to those thoughts. So that is very powerful when you realize things that are bothering you that you're thinking of, they're not you. These are thoughts that are coming into your head that you, you can't necessarily uh, control. It's not your fault, but it's very powerful when you know that um, you can dismiss them, you can ignore them, you can choose to say, ah, like, there you are, I was expecting you, you know, right on time, every night I have these thoughts, and just saying, not tonight, or like, I'm choosing to rest, we're not going to do this tonight, and some of these things sound kind of corny, but saying them to yourself, or saying them out loud, or whatever helps, um, really has been the biggest thing for me, dealing with my racing thoughts, was accepting that I can control my reaction to the thoughts and I can rest. And those have been life changing for, for me and for a lot of my clients. And they're probably two of the simplest things that I talk about, but simple is good, especially when it comes to something like sleep, because we're just, sleep is supposed to be simple. It's, it shouldn't be a big expensive thing. It shouldn't be a, a huge secret. I feel like I'm going off on a tangent from like what we were originally talking about, but it just reminds me of some of the um, advanced reviews that I got on my book. So far, the reviews have been amazing, and I'm finding that women who struggle with insomnia are really enjoying it and resonating with it and connecting with it, which is wonderful. That was exactly what I wanted. I had a, a comment that was made in a review. I find I'm good with criticism. I know not everybody's going to love everything that I do and they're not all going to like me and that's okay. Um, they'll find someone else that they, that they connect with. But the comment was that um, the information in the book, there wasn't really anything in the book that I couldn't find with a simple internet search. And I laughed when I read that because first of all, I thought, well, yeah, you could say that about any, book really um, the internet has everything we could ever want on it and then as I was thinking about it over the next couple days I actually started to think you know what that's a really great point I'm really glad she felt that way because sleep shouldn't be difficult and it shouldn't be a big secret and I don't want to have the book that someone has to pay to read to actually to finally be able to fall asleep like sleep should be something that's just real readily available for all of us we should be able to fall asleep easily um with a few techniques that we find with a simple internet search so it started out as something that i i thought was funny and it was like critical but really as i started to think about it i went yeah that's the kind of book i want to have though like i want people to feel like the tr these things are simple enough that i could do them tonight it's, it's not something that now I have to put a 37 step process into or that I have to spend a lot of money to learn about. I want these to be simple things that, that you listen to this today and tonight you could already sleep better because you put it into practice. That's exactly what I want. If somebody reads my book and says it was good, but I don't feel like any of this is really applicable or these things are too difficult for me, then I failed miserably as an author of a book. Honestly. <laughs> I love you. I like, when I read your book, I found it really easy to read. So that was so <laughs> important for me because I've always, believe it or not, struggled with English, with reading, but just mm. tried my heart out from a very young age, thanks to my mother's influence, taking me to the library every Friday and buying me a Golden Gate book. But I loved how this was so easy to read because I feel that if someone feels that they struggle reading, that they can actually manage reading this book. Um, and I actually really loved how you talked about not only why sleep is important, but how to calculate your bedtime, the stages of sleep. You dive into your bedroom, how to perfect your sleep environment, changing your thinking about sleeping, like celebrating sleepiness. What I really learned in this book is that between 10 and 12 p.m. at night, you talked about how melatonin is actually 
that's when you're most sleepiest. That's when you become sleepy. And if you're yawning, instead of sort of fighting the going to bed, just celebrate <laughs> it and go to bed. And that for every hour you sleep is equivalent to two hours versus if you go to bed after midnight. So for me, that was so interesting. But I also loved, so one of the things for our listeners, if they're joining in, if our listeners um, don't have like a sleep bed routine or perhaps they're on their social media looking at Instagram or maybe they're on Snapchat because a lot of kids have got Snapchat these days and people, people are staying connected to all hours of the morning, like 11 p.m. They're talking to friends, family, random, strangers. So the, the, <laughs> the mind is like, you know, eight different conversations happening. And I found when I did that, it was so stressful. I got so stressed out, like I'm trying to sort of get instantly connect and talk. And I realized that if I went back to the basics of when I grew up as a kid in Australia, after 8.30 p.m., if we rang someone's house, it was rude because they should be getting <laughs> ready for bed. And I kind of decided if I went back to that basic principle, like if I haven't spoken to someone during the day or after dinner, like, you know, and I feel that going back to basics is a good thing. But for someone who's struggling to go to bed, what are a couple of things that they could do to help rest or get the body and the brain and the mind like prepared or ready? Hmm. Because I've found that just trying to look at Instagram and, and connecting to people and talking, you know, doing these kinds of things at 10 p.m. at night isn't cool, doesn't work for me. So maybe our listeners are out there and maybe they're struggling with going to bed, but maybe it's because they're trying to talk to so many people, you know, late in the evening and it's not serving them their highest good. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a tough one. It's a tough one because we have laptops and we have TV screens and we have phones and we have smart watches. And so there's constantly a screen in front of us and it's really hard to unplug or remove the phone from your room. I like to try to make my advice as like realistic as possible for somebody to do something that I wouldn't myself do or try. One of the things that's huge, I, I can tell you that uh, not looking at your phone for an hour before bed is a great thing to do. And it is, but I think that's kind of hardcore for a lot of people. I don't think it's realistic to expect someone not to look at their phone an hour before bed. But I think all of our phones have blue light filters on them. Or we have an app store where we can download a free blue light filter. And that's kind of my first thing that I tell people to do. And it seems like a lot of people are just like, Poof. like they're like, I didn't even know that this is a thing. It is. Um, iPhones have, have one. You go to your settings and they have like night shift. I think one of them was called. Um, and apps like look up blue light filter on in your app store or on your phone. Um, what they do is they cast a um, like a subtle kind of red or pink glow on your screen and you can adjust it as well. It doesn't have to be like a harsh red. Um, I find too, if you know, you're looking at pictures or, or something, you don't want a red screen. Um, but it, it blocks the blue light by putting a red filter on it and you can schedule it to come on at a certain time at night. Um, I like to, mine comes on at eight o'clock at night and then it turns off at eight o'clock in the morning. So if I pick up my phone in the middle of the night, I can't sleep or I use it for the light to go to the bathroom or something, um, that filter is still on it and it's still protecting me from the blue light from the screen. And I, I do find that a lot of people still don't know that they have one of those on their phone. And it seems weird when you first put it on, but actually if you were to remove it, 
it hurts your eyes. So you can tell that it's working. It's like blue blocker glasses do the same thing, but this is like blue blocker glasses for your screen. So you, is, uh, you, sorry. Sorry, Beth. Can I ask, is the blue light then, so if we're expo exposed to say our mobile phone without the blue light blocker, does that sort of keep us like serotonin, but wired, like keeps the brain alert? Whereas yeah, it blocks, yeah. Sorry, so it blocks melatonin production. <laughs> this is like chatting oh, over video. Okay, no, like. this makes sense. Yeah. So we need melatonin at night to slow down the brain, prepare the body sleepy. for sleep. But when we're looking yeah. at our phone, it's sort of keeping us awake, wired. Um, yeah. It's we're not creating melatonin by looking at it compared to say if we're reading a book because I read in your book that if you're reading a book and we mean a real book that <laughs> it can help like reduce this kind of book yeah that we can help <laughs> reduce stress by 68 percent by reading a real book and you mentioned that getting ready for bed, bed you could go for a walk listen to calming music um, read a real book but what you're saying is with so many people wanting to sort of use their phone as um, a way to either read or look or they're trying to cram things in if they get this blue light blocker that can help can that then create a, a sense of sleepiness if they are looking at their phone say at nine o'clock at night can they still, do you think, go into that sleepy stage? I, you know what? I don't know the exact percentage of how much blue light it blocks. I don't think it should be a replacement for just turning off your phone and not looking at your phone. It's kind of one of those things that I like to tell people, like, if you're not going to put your phone down, at least put a blue light filter on yeah. it. So you're filtering some of the blue light that you're getting. Um, but also, one of the things that I like to recommend to people who are having a hard time winding down for bed or being aware um, that like bedtime is coming, I should start preparing for it. Setting an alarm uh, look, on your phone. So that's why, it's, you know, good to have a blue light filter. Setting a light on your, on your phone or if you have like a, an Apple Watch or a Fitbit or like a smart watch that allows you to set an alarm having an alarm go off like 45 minutes to an hour before you want to be in bed is a great way to even just for a, like a few days or a few, for a few weeks to remind you bedtime is coming, start wrapping it up. Like whatever it is that you're working on, it's, it's time to start cleaning it up, putting stuff away, maybe dim the lights, um, get into cozier clothes, like go brush your teeth, start preparing for bed because the best way the best way to go to sleep is to prepare for it. I always kind of use the analogy of like when we were little, if you think of like a toddler playing, running around, having fun, playing with toys, you never just like, oh, time for bed, pick them up and drop them in bed and expect them to fall asleep. You have a bedtime routine for them. And I think I kind of wish we would get back to that. And I don't know why we stopped doing that. I guess we just thought like, I'm so important. I don't need a bedtime routine, but you still do. Um, our bodies, our minds are still like when we were little, like we, we're still growing, we're still, you know, recharging at night. And if you think of it that way, like I'm a toddler, <laughs> like I'm busy during the day, I'm doing all these things or I'm having fun or I'm, you know, building my fort or whatever under my bed. When it's, when bedtime comes, you usually get an announcement. Like an adult will always go like, okay, go brush your teeth. It's time, or time to get in your pajamas. Like, that's how I want you to think of it is like, okay, bedtime is coming. I'm going to go get in my pajamas now. I'm going to, you know, wash my face. Um, start preparing for bed knowing it's coming. And for people who struggle with insomnia symptoms, I also like to tell them to start speaking kindly about sleep to yourself. Like as you're getting ready for bed, telling yourself like, this is going to feel so good. Or I can't wait to get in my cozy bed. Or like, I love my bed. I can't wait to do this. And I always say when you're in bed, like let out a happy sigh. Um, because changing your relationship with your bed is also an important part of changing your sleep. 
Because if you go into anything believing it's going to be awful, it's likely going to be awful. So preparing for bed and telling yourself, like, here we go. Like, this is my favorite time of the night's coming. <laughs> like, all of those things definitely help. Wow. I love those tips. And that preparing for bed, because in your book I read, like, if you literally have a clutter-free bedroom, a clean bedroom, you know, those clean sheets, Chris, you make it like a nice thing to do. It's not going to be a struggle. You're not going to like be overwhelmed. It's all about the resting and the repairing and making peace with it. And I personally, since I set, you know, you're talking about setting that time. I worked out, you know, I need eight hours sleep. This is when I wake up. This is when I'm going to have to go to bed because I've set that alarm on my iPhone. Even like last night, I was like, right, this is my cue to start winding down, slowing down. I've mastered my mind of like, my mind's going to be like, oh, just do one more thing, one more thing. And it's like, <laughs> oh, whoa down, slow down. And it's like, I'm in control. No, we are going to bed. So I'll put my phone up. One of the things I do is I have an ensuite. So I put my phone actually in the ensuite. I charge it and I put it on aeroplane mode. I've found that as soon as I have taken the mobile phone out away from my head, because mm. I used to have it near my head and it used to be on, and I found that for some reason I must be so energetically in tune, I was really conscious that the whole world was still going on, happening in mm. that phone. And I find that if I want to have a complete break from the world, I can even just turn my whole mobile phone off that obviously the days I don't have to go to work, but completely disconnect from the world. So I found by putting it out of my room, it's been good, but I'm really blessed that I've got an ensuite like right in the next door there where I understand some people can't, but um, having it on aeroplane mode has been great. And I've also found like, yeah, I'm doing the reading before going to bed. I'm winding, which gets me really sleepy. Uh, and just, I have like a lavender spray because I saw that you love essential oils are amazing. So I have a lavender spray where I can spritz around my room and just finding that I found that is, you're right. You talked about like, you can't just get the baby and drop them. I found, <laughs> um, you know, preparing for bed that hour before, like you say, washing your teeth. I do my skincare routine and I kind of, it's a whole kind of self care ritual now. And by doing that, I, it has really helped improve my sleep. Mm. But it's taken me some time to work this out, to figure it out. Because I was like, why am I so, you know, anxious at night? And why can't I go to sleep? Why am I so wide awake? Oh, my brain is wide awake. And then I was like, hang on a minute. It's because I'm like trying to hustle right up to bedtime. And it's now like, boom, 11 o'clock and you got to go to bed. And it's just like I've been hustling with, you know, 20 odd people and so definitely for me I found um disconnecting from social media a huge thing and having that downtime and time off it has really improved my overall health so any listeners out there if you're a little bit like me stressed out wondering why am I stressed out and I found in COVID-19 if I was reading the news and, and, and kind of like reading all of the disasters that are happening and, you know, the death tolls and, and the increase of rates happening in the US and, and around the world, it was so overwhelming. It wasn't actually a great way to prep for sleep. There's a whole <laughs> lot of fear happening there. Fear, yeah. stress, anxiety, the news. Um, so not looking at the news before bed, I found to be very beneficial, but I think we can get sucked in to wanting to look at the news. But so by doing a lot of the things that you suggest in here, and there are so many amazing tips, and we'd have to have a podcast show like all day, Beth, to talk about <laughs> how to do the thought dumping, the gratitude journaling, 
how to do peaceful bedtime activities, which for me is a huge uh, for people who really want to get a good night's sleep to our listeners out there. I loved how you shared the meditation on focusing on your breath. And that was just, that is so powerful because I've found that if I want to calm down and relax, I can focus on my breath. And when you learn that, which you teach here in the book, it's really, really can change the way you feel when you're laying in bed. So there are so yes. many tips here, so many amazing things. Like I love how you actually go into um, pets on the bed. You talk about in your books, falling asleep, the sleeping positions. There is so much information here and even like um, deep breathing and you, you talk about deep breathing techniques, the abdominal breathing, the square breath. Like there is so much information. So you're huge on meditation, aren't you? And breathing as a great way to unwind at night. I am, but I have to say too, I'm not, I don't meditate during the day. I, I think I'm, I have a busy mind and I just find that quieting my mind during the day. Meditation isn't really enjoyable for me during the day, but it's been amazing at night. Like as soon as I lay down and I, it, my mind would start to go, it's another one of those things that just sounds so simple, but using your own breath. And one of the things I, I like to do is I picture my breath as a color like saying like the breath, thinking of the breath as being purple so that you can see it and picturing it as I'm breathing in, I'm picturing it filling my mouth, feeling like going down into my body, into my lungs and picturing it in my body. And then as I'm exhaling, I'm picturing the, the purple breath is leaving and filling the space around me. And it's just one of those, I don't know. It's funny that just thinking about something else besides my day helps you fall asleep. And something as simple as, or even just thinking of your breath coming in and out of your nostrils um, and feeling how it feels when it comes, when you inhale it and exhale. And I actually I spoke to someone um, during the week who had said, I think this is meditation, but I, I wouldn't actually, he goes, I, I don't really know what it's called, but he says, every night when I go to bed, I relax, I start at my toes and I relax every part of my body. And I picture myself, like I think of each part relaxing. And he goes, I never get up to the top. I always fall asleep before that happens. And I went, that's meditation. It doesn't have to be a difficult thing. It doesn't, you don't have to, um, you don't have to sit in a, a certain way if you don't want to. You can lie in your bed and be comfortable. You don't have to do anything special with your hands. You don't have to wear anything special. You don't have to buy special equipment for it. It's just, it's breathing in, it's breathing out, and it's thinking about that breath as you're breathing in and out. It's almost too simple sometimes. Wow. <laughs> I, think. Love, I don't know I, that that would work. No, but I love that. I love that because you're right. So many people think, they think of like when we were raised in Australia, the only people who meditated at that point in time was Buddhist monks. So we thought you had to go to the Himalayans or somewhere very spiritual, like up in the, the Himalayan mountains to become enlightened by a monk or somewhere you had to get on a plane, leave Australia to be enlightened, to become a meditation, you know, like to actually yeah. learn how to meditate. Well, what I've realized over the many years, and I talk about this in my book too, Beth, it starts with me, is you do not have to be a Buddhist monk. Um, you don't have to, it's got nothing to do with religion or anything to do that with that. It's about just connecting to your own breath and self and how the breathing in, like you said, and the breathing out can just slow the brain down, the nervous system, you know, and just get your body and brain and, and everything in mind into a slower pace and it just slows it down and relaxes you. So for go-getters, I love how you also share that you do your meditation at night because I think for anyone who's got racing thoughts in their head, 
or really stressed out with COVID-19, doing it in bed when the kids aren't there going, mom, 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 or dad, 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 dad. You know, like it gives them an opportunity to actually be able to fit that self-care ritual in at bedtime. So I love how you just shared that because that is amazing. Like for me, I do meditation in the morning and then I do a meditation again. I try my best to do it at night as well. And, but then it's just something I've gotten into the habit of now doing because I'm at home and not actually traveling because of COVID-19. But I think for everyone who's a busy mum, carer, dad, whatever, go-getter, then at least if they fit it in in the evening, they're getting that in. But I just love how you said you don't have to be sitting in a position. Like there's no... You could do this. Like, yeah. <laughs> you don't even need an app. It's just breathing in and breathing out. And you teach that in your book, which is what I really, really love. So for anyone who's wondering, like you want to really dive deep into creating bedtime rituals, getting more rest and sleep and making it a friend and really focusing on your health, like mental, physical, emotional, spiritual health and well-being. I, this book, The Calm and Cozy Book of Sleep by Beth Wyatt is absolutely amazing and I can't wait for everyone to grab a copy in Australia but also online if you're in the UK, the Canada or US, it's available on Amazon. Now, Beth, I could talk to you seriously all day and night <laughs> about sleep, but because it is actually nighttime where you are in Canada, we will have to actually wrap up our Spirit Girl Talk Show podcast I just love that you've gone um, the extra mile and written a book to help people. I feel that this book alone actually gets you ready for bed because you're reading a book about sleep and how to make friends with it and how to do it. And I think for anyone struggling with insomnia, it opens up so many different ideas and opportunities and I think for anyone who has kids or teenagers who are really struggling with anxiety and sleep that this is still a beautiful brilliant book because even young people 15 like it does affect every age group if you're not getting enough sleep and the body's not repairing and I know this personally from my own sleep struggles, that it is so important to get sleep. And that's why I really wanted to share what you do at the sleepcoach.com and your book also, because I really want to connect our audience, our listeners globally, so they can also do a little audit. Are you sleeping? Are you getting enough sleep? Do you have a set bedtime routine? What does your sleep rituals look like? What does your room look like? What does it feel like? <laughs> How do you feel when you go to bed? Do you have so many racing thoughts that you're like, oh, I can't get to bed. I can't switch off. So, Beth, thank you so much for your time. I'm super, super grateful and honoured again that we got to catch up on the Spirit Girl Talk Show podcast. How can our audience stay in contact with you now? I am Sleep Coach Beth on Instagram and Facebook. My website is sleepcoachbeth.com. I have a podcast that's, it'll be really easy for you to remember if you have the Common Cozy Book of Sleep because it's called the Common Cozy Podcast. So the podcast came before the book, um, but we uh, put them together. We thought they'd be a good pair and it's an adorable name. So Calm and Cozy podcast. It's on iTunes and Spotify and everywhere that you would find um, find podcasts. I also have a Facebook group that goes with the book. Yeah, I call it kind of like a companion a companion um, workshop kind of 
because as a coach, as somebody who likes to help people put things into practice, I felt like just offering a book wasn't enough. I want to also be there to help people step by step, go through techniques and put things into practice or decide what they need help with. So the Common Cozy Book Club, we'll just stick with Common Cozy for everything. The Common Cozy Book Club on Facebook, if you search for it, it's also on my website. There's a, a lot of links there for it. You can come in. Um, it's free. As you're reading the book, you don't, you know what? You don't even have to read the book. You can just come in and we'll talk about sleep and I'd love to meet, meet you and, and help you with uh, whatever it is that you need help with, with your sleep that, that cannot be taken care of by a doctor, of course. <laughs> yeah, that is so amazing. I love how you have the book club and you're right. Obviously your first point of call is your GP. <laughs> Unfortunately, in Australia, sometimes when it's with elderly people, mm. they don't necessarily at all times get to the core of the sleep problem. Some people might be suffering with depression and that's a reason why they're not getting enough sleep or, or, or high levels of anxiety. And they can tend to just go straight to prescribing sleeping tablets. And in my experience, um, even with my own family, my mother, I've learned that people who, are in, who have insomnia or some form of depression or anxiety, that giving their elderly just a sleeping tablet or giving people sleeping tablets is not necessarily a long-term solution and a way forward. So I always recommend people on top of the GP, whether you get a second opinion or whether you talk to specialists as well who are specialised and along with the help of yourself, Beth, with the books and surrounding yourself with positive influences and getting a coach so you can really work on your own bedtime routines because sometimes it could be something that a person isn't doing at night. Like for me, I discovered you know, looking at my phone one hour prior to like right up to sleep wasn't working for me. Um, so it's kind of like you have to individually, it's such an individual thing mm -hmm. working on what you need to do to get your sleep in and to feel like you can go to sleep. So 100% see your GP, but at the same time, really, really just dig deep like, I always say to one person, don't just get one opinion, get two, get three, get four, but really work on doing, finding a way that works for you. And you're right. I love how you say a good night's sleep can change your life. So Beth, we will say goodbye to our beautiful Spirit Girl podcast listeners, which I'm super grateful that you tune in every single week or when you can, as Beth said, and I really hope you've enjoyed listening to Beth Wyatt's story of why she wanted, what inspired her to become a sleep coach and an author. And I can't wait for you now to stay in contact with Beth via her website at sleepcoachbeth.com to grab her latest book, The Sleep Coach's Book, because I really want you to get a good night's sleep. I know it is the ultimate act of self-care and I'm just so grateful I got to share Beth's story and words of wisdom and tips with you. And I hope you can take one thing from this and try it. I would love to hear if it changes your life. I'd love to hear if this podcast show has inspired you to focus more on your sleep your health, your wellness, and getting a good night's sleep. So on that note, we will say goodbye. And be sure to subscribe to the Spirit Girl Talk Show podcast, to leave a five-star rating and review, and to tell someone you love to. You can stay in contact with myself, Yvette Lee Blowitz, on Instagram, or stay in contact with Spirit It Girl on any social media app. Just type in Spirit Girl and you will find our self-care spa community too. On that note, we'll say goodbye, Beth. Bye.
<laughs> Bye. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. I can't wait to have you on the show again. Bye for now. <laughs> Bye. Take care.